Okay, welcome to the last session. Uh, we're gonna hear uh, Sarah Guido talk to us about uh, data wrangling. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah Guido, and this is the wild west of data wrangling. And what I mean by that is the messy, complicated world of data that data scientists like myself operate in every day, all day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, or maybe eight hours a day, five days a week. Um, I'm not taking any questions. I have a lot to get through, so, um, but please tweet at me. I'm very responsive on Twitter, so uh, if you feel inclined, I'm at Sarah underscore Guido. So this talk is basically a day in the life of a data scientist. What I go through every day, getting data into proper for format for modeling. It's sometimes messy and complicated, so I'm going to show you three examples of dealing with super uncooperative data. So data that's been in some way flawed, whether that's class imbalance or there's something wrong with the structure of the data or I've had to do some acrobatics to transform the data properly. So uh, this is just my own experience working in the industry. So it's not necessarily any sort of ground truth for how you should be working with your data. This is just my own experience, um, but I hope you can learn something useful. Also, this talk is mostly for people with less experience in data science to sort of give you a taste of what it's like to work as a data scientist. So I'm if you are a data scientist, I'm going to be talking very high level and simplifying a lot of things. So sorry, not sorry. But first, who am I? I am a senior data scientist at Mashable in New York City. I've worked in the, in the data science industry in New York for around three years now. And I've dealt with a lot of different kinds of data. I've dealt with agricultural data, commercial real estate data, ad data, user activity engagement data, media data, large data, small data, medium data, all of it. Um, so Mashable, if you don't know, is a, a digital media site that publishes a lot of articles about internet culture, entertainment, tech, We're really cool, you should check us out. Um, I do all of my data sciencing in Python. I use Jupyter Notebooks every day. I use NumPy, SciPy, Scikit, Pandas, you name it, I'm using it. And once again, you can find me on Twitter at at Sarah underscore Guido. So here we have the Iris data set. And if you've done anything with data science, you already know about this data set. But basically, this is a very simple, clean, tidy data set. There are four features related to the characteristics of the iris, and there's uh, a species column, which is the, the de designation of the species of iris for that particular flower. So this data set is mostly used to exemplify classification. You're, you're trying to classify these different irises into a specific species based on their characteristics. So the idea for this talk came out of a conversation I was having with some friends of mine about how a lot of material out there online sets this very simple premise for doing data science. And the premise is this. You start by importing a very simple data set like this. You import the corresponding scikit-learn model, whether that's a classification model or regression model. Uh, you run it, boom, you've done data science. So easy. I'm here to tell you that's not how it is. A lot of material gives the impression that working with data is all sunshine and rainbows. It's very easy. Um, you put some data in, some magic happens, you get some results, it's great. When in reality, the landscape is a, a little more complicated than that. Um, it's a little bit more, it's a little bit more labor intensive. There's lots of twists and turns. You go through some, some transformations along the way. It's very complicated and real data by that I mean the data that your company is collecting is messy, it's frustrating, it's sometimes missing, it's sometimes wrong, it's incomplete, it's not what you need. So I'm going to walk through three examples of how I've dealt with this messy, weird data. So the first example of this comes from my time working at a small commercial real estate startup in New York City. So this particular startup, um, they had a platform that if you're a real estate firm, you can look up different information about buildings in New York City, like if you're interested in acquiring a building or something. Um, so a problem that I worked on was trying to see if we could predict if a building was going to sell in the following year. So the data that I was working with, I had about four years worth of data on building sales in New York City, and all collected from the city of New York. Uh, the city of New York has a really great open data policy, so 
That's why this was possible. And I had information like the number of floors in the building, the location, the square footage, the price per square footage, um, high level financials information like uh, income and expenses and total revenue. And the goal was to use this data to sort of predict if a building might go on the market the following year in order to provide some, some valuable insight to the people actually using our platform who may or may not be interested in buying buildings. So this seems like pretty straightforward, trying to predict uh, if a building is going to sell or not sell. So pretty simple binary classification problem. So my first thought was to use logistic regression. So logistic regression is a good model choice when you have a binary classification problem and numerical data to use for that classification. So this model determines the probability of a data point falling into a particular class. So if you take a look at this very simple code here, we're fitting a uh, logistic regression model and some training data. And then that bottom line there, the predict proba function, um, you can run on a specific piece of data and see the probabilities for the classes. So you can see the first class is around 1% predicted probability, the second class is around 98%, so the class that would be returned for this particular example in the data would be the second class. So logistic regression ultimately returns the class with the highest probability for all the data points in your set. So great. So here's the thing about the data set that I was working with. 95% uh, of the time, the building was not going to sell. And this makes sense. Buildings aren't going on the market every six months or whatever. Mostly they're not selling. So this means that only 5% of my data set was actually sale. So I imported my logistic regression function, and I ran it, and I got a 95% accuracy score. Great, done. I've done data science. Hold up. <laughs> so I could just guess no sale 100% of the time and end up with 95% accuracy, which is totally, totally wrong. So like, we don't care if the building is not going to sell. We only really care if the building is going to sell. It's that last 5% that we really, really care about. So this is a fine example of class imbalance in my data set. So class imbalance is when the value that you're trying to predict, the values are not equal. So this can create bias in classification models. A lot of models are dependent on an even distribution in your classes. So, once I realized I had this problem, I had to figure out, okay, what do I do? So I tried a few other methods of balancing out my data set. I tried undersampling, which is taking less samples from the overbalanced class to train on. So this would be taking more of, or taking less of the no-sale no classes. I tried oversampling, which is taking more of the underrepresented class. But the problem with these methods is that they create bias in your data set because you're, you're fundamentally altering the structure of your data set. So what to do? Enter gradient boosting. So gradient boosting produces a prediction model in the form of an ensemble of weak prediction models, typically decision trees. So uh, I use gradient boosted trees to help alleviate this problem a little bit. So it's an ensemble method, meaning it creates a bunch of trees. In this case, it creates a bunch of weaker decision trees. Um, and the concept of boosting is that weak learners can be modified to perform better. So, so what does this actually mean, though? Um, at a very, very high level, this is the part where I said sorry, not sorry, to the, ac the actual data scientists in the audience. At a very high level, think of it like this. Um, imagine that you're preparing for an exam that you're going to take several times. So the first time you take the exam, maybe you get like a low score, like 35%. And then when you're studying again for the exam, you really, really focus on all the stuff you got wrong. So maybe the next time you take it, you get to like 37%. And then once again, you study really, really intensely on the stuff you got wrong. And you do it again and again and again. And then you, you combine all of your decision trees, and then uh, they can be modified to create this much more intelligent and robust learner. So I, in this particular project, I managed to increase my accuracy a little bit, um, and then unfortunately the project got canned. So that also happens when you're a data scientist. Sometimes you work on something for a while, and then they're like, why are you doing this? We don't need this. I'm like, oh, well, six weeks ago you told me to do it. That's okay. All right, my next example. My next example is from my time working at Bitly. Um, 
So at Bitly, uh, we have a lot of click data. Every time you click on a Bitly link, it generates a string of data. So what we were interested in was how can we identify similar patterns for our users based on click data. So we wanted to know and understand how people interact with content over time. So if we can take people's collections of interactions and compare them to each other and see are there any similar patterns in how people access content across the internet. Um, so the data that we were working with, the time, it was all like based on when you click on a bit.ly link, um, the time of the click, the location, the cookie, which we use the cookie as a unique identifier, uh, the browser user agent string, which can be parsed to get the device type, the operating system, and the browser, uh, the referrer, so whether it's coming from social media like Twitter or Facebook. So we wanted to understand how people interact with content over time, and also for particular clients, they might be interested in what other content people are looking at when they're not looking at their own content. So for example, if I'm some kind of sporting news site like ESPN, and I can see these different interactions, maybe I want to know um, when people aren't looking at my sports content, are they looking at other sports content? Should we be covering this other sports content? So that could be potentially useful. So I do want to make a note of something here. I have to confess that I was not using Python. I was using Scala. Why Scala? So at the time uh, when I was trying to work with PySpark, this was uh, late 2015, PySpark was not super great at that time. Um, I was trying to do, and this is another, this is kind of like a minor data, well, it was kind of a major data problem at the time as well. Sometimes the tool you work with contributes to your data headache and may not be the best tool for the job. So I was trying to um, do these complex data transformations in, in PySpark, and I kept getting this error that said, type error, Java package, object not callable. That's not something that I could fix. That's a bug weighted down in the PySpark source code. So. Uh, my good friend Andrew Musselman kindly tweeted at me to use the Scala API. So I ended up um, learning Scala in order to use Spark, which was a whole other story that I could go on, but we won't. So back to the original problem. My original problem is trying to cluster user interactions, and a great way to do this is k-means clustering. k-means is a pretty simple unsupervised method. Um, it groups get together data based on a learning metric, and it's iterative. So first step, you assign your data points to k number of clusters. Um, you update the mean of those clusters based on the data points in that cluster. And then you reassign the data points based on their proximity to the nearest cluster center. And then you do this again and again and again until this cluster centers no longer really move around. So here's the problem with what I was trying to do. Um, first, though, we only wanted to look at users with five or more clicks. So we figured that if someone had clicked on a link maybe twice, maybe once, that wasn't really informative in comparing different collections of interactions. So we, we took users with five or more clicks. Um, so this meant that each user could have a different number of interactions. So some had five clicks, some had seven clicks, some had 15, and so on. So if I just took the data set uh, as, as each one of those clicks individually, it's possible that each data point for a specific user could end up in different clusters. And that would be a problem because we want to compare the entire collection of interactions to each other, uh, not just the individual ones. So this is, what, uh, this is an example of what data is collected when you click on a bit.ly link. So this is a very simplified version of it. So we have the cookie as the unique identifier. Uh, we have the date the date of the click, we have the link, the link they clicked on, location, and the refer. So this would be an example of, of a collection of clicks for a particular user. Cookie one, these are all belonging to the same user. So if I tried running clustering just on this set here, I could end up with something like this, where data points for the, the same user end up in different clusters, which is definitely not what we want. So how do we effectively do this? So at the time, um, I had several ideas for how to do this, but the, but the way that I decided to do this was to roll up the data from a collection of interactions to one 
representative observation for each journey, for each click journey. So there are pros and cons of this method, the pro being that I could actually cluster all the user interactions, the con being that you lose some information when you roll up data. Um, there's always a trade-off when you're transforming your data. But this, this was, at the time was a nice way to capture it. So something to keep in mind when you're, when you're doing stuff like this is that how you transform the data will most certainly affect your model and what happens to your results. So uh, you need to put a lot of thought into it. So here we have, once again, um, the set of data belonging to the same user, cookie one. So let's go about rolling some of this up. So let's look at the date column. So we have five dates uh, chronologically. So uh, we can represent this, this collection of interactions in several ways. So we could take the length of the interaction. So five, five clicks happened on five different days. So we could say five for that. We could also calculate the average time in between interactions which here comes out to around eight days. So if we look at the referrer column, uh, we have two referrers. Um, in the actual data set, we had a lot more. It's a little bit more complicated to show. So here we have two referrers. Um, a way to encode this and a much better way to compare to other users is we could one hot encode the data that we have and then transform it to a matrix. So one hot encoding is transforming data, categorical data like this, to arrays of ones and zeros. So Facebook would become one zero, Twitter would become zero one, and then we transform it into a matrix, and matrices are much easier to compare it to each other, at least in this, in this situation. So if we go through rolling it up, we end up with something that looks kind of like this. So this is just, I put it in a dictionary. Um, the average time between is around eight days. The cookie, which is our unique identifier, is still cookie one. For the links, um, I decided to compare links uh, using a bag of words modeling, which is a nat natural language processing method that's often used to compare documents to each other. It represents collections of words or, or text, in this case links, is a set of words, a bag of words, and then you can compare bags of words to each other via similarity metric. Um, let's see, we have location, USA. Uh, if everyone was USA, we'd probably just drop that. It's not important. Number of interactions, five, and then refer. There's that refer matrix, which one zero is Facebook, zero one is Twitter. So, I mean, there are a couple of problems with this. First of all, we're losing the sequencing of the clicks, right? So um, we're not capturing like, oh, linked one was clicked first, then link two was clicked, then awesome linked link was clicked. Um, so that's kind of being lost, as well as like the more, the more fine-tuned details of the the date and, and the time between and whatnot. Um, so the, the, the other problem when I was working on this project was that uh, I was at the mercy of a very strict deadline. So I had, I had thought of another way to sort of do this, which was to start each, uh, each collection of, of user interactions in its own cluster and then group it together that way. However, at that time, Spark did not allow an easy way to do that. So I was working with a slightly less sophisticated tool I should also mention we were using Spark in the first place because we were dealing with legitimately large-scale data. So Bitly produces around seven terabytes of data in a day, so not something I can just download to my laptop and mess around with. Um, so, but ultimately, this approach did what I wanted it to do, which was effectively and efficiently cluster similar user interactions into the same cluster. Um, and it was actually kind of interesting running this, we actually got some really interesting results. Um, like I think for one, one client that we ran this on, we found that they were like, there's this like cluster of people who are really interested in Red Bull or something. It's like kind of surprising, but very interesting. All right, one more example. So my last example is from the work that I'm currently doing at Mashable. So at Mashable, I've been doing a lot of work to understand who our audience is. We want to know who our audience is so we can take a more data-driven approach to content creation, figure out, okay, this group of people really likes our business section, so we should target them at this time, stuff like that. So the problem, the core problem is how do we effectively describe our audience? Describing them beyond just pure page views and uniques and ses click session data. So, um, 
The data that I worked with to do a couple of different things was anonymized demographic and interest data. So demographic data being data like gender and age, age bracket, and then interest data being things like movie lover and TV lover and news junkie, which all come from Google Analytics. Uh, so the goal was to build out our own in-house audience segments that were really tailored to the audience that we have, as well as uh, dig into each of the different channels that we have and see what's going on there. And by channel, I mean the subsections on our website. So the tech channel, the water cooler channel, the entertainment channel, each of these channels um, has engagement from different groups of people, so we were interested in learning more about who those groups were. So here's the problem, the Google Analytics API. So uh, there, were, there were a few issues with the data that I pulled for this. So the Google Analytics API, um, I should also mention, we were, we were not paying for the Google Analytics API, so we have like a very, very limited rate. We also cannot afford to pay for the Google Analytics API, so that's like another trade-off that you often have to make is um, sometimes the, the software you need to go get the data you want is not quite cheap enough for your budget. So I would send, so I was doing some analysis on our water cooler channel, and I, I wanted to get demographics information for a set of URLs. And the way that the API works is you send it a URL and then uh, demographics and interest data gets returned back to you for, for specific URLs. So I would send a collection of URLs and I would get back data for maybe one third of the URL set that I sent. And this is because there's a, a particular like view threshold for returning demographic data. This is so you can't try and identify like who the people are that are looking at your links, which makes sense. We don't, we don't want to identify actual people, we just want to no general char characteristics about the audience. Um, but that threshold is not mentioned anywhere in the documentation, and we don't really know what it is. So sometimes I would send collections of URLs to the API, and I would get a lot of data back. Sometimes I would get less than a third back. It's very finicky. The other thing is that the interest groups were semi-useless. So for example, movie lover. Everyone is a movie lover. That is, <laughs> that is a, uh, an interest group that we saw basically on every URL that we sent. Movie lover, TV lover, news junkie. Yeah, it was like, okay, these aren't particularly useful. Um, even the, the, smaller, the smaller, less represented interest groups, um, what were they, like green living enthusiast. Like, it's also like really hard to relate those things to our own data. So um, at some point, what we want to do is like build out our own interest groups, but that's like a six-month-long project. So, okay. So what, what do we do about this? Insufficient data, not super great for the problems we're trying to solve. First, accept that data has defeated you. Wait, no, don't do that. I have no fancy data trickery for this example. Um, you just have to make it work, as Tim Gunn says. Um, sometimes you will have to work with less than ideal data. And you'll just have to, because you're trying to give your editorial team insight. You're trying to prove value for your team. Um, you have to make a judgment about what you can and what you can't do. And it's usually better to say, I did this, but here are some caveats, as opposed to, I can't do this at all. Um, because sometimes you just can't get what you need. So making it work. Uh, I managed to do some interesting things that indicate the need for further research, further, uh, further research and likely a better source of this demographic and interest data. So the first is that um, when I was doing my analysis on the water cooler channel, uh, before I, I mentioned that everyone is a movie lover, um, I, we, we sort of came up with this theory of highly performant links in that uh, links that are highly performant have um, basically like outlier levels of page views and uniques, draw in a much broader audience than those that are smaller. So rather than smaller audience segments driving link performance, it's sort of the other way around where link performance pulls in a much broader swath of audience. Um, that's, that's a theory, something that we would like to prove but need much better data in order to do so. Um, another thing, that we that I worked on was audience segmentation. So 
I did some audience segmentation through archetypal analysis, which is a method of clustering that finds extreme points in the data as the basis for clustering, a little bit different than k-means. Um, and these segments were interesting, and they were also like very relevant. Um, they were mostly like different subsets of millennials who like flock to our site, which is who we're writing for. So great, we were hitting our tar target audience. But the, the, the breakdown of the segmentation was actually pretty interesting. And again, um, we found these things, and, and in no way are we saying this is like perfect analysis, we did everything we were supposed to do, these are the segments that we should commit our lives to. No, because the data was insufficient. Um, you know, I, whenever I talk to the editorial team about these results, I, I always say, this, this is what we found, however, there are some caveats. And they understand, hopefully. Um, and then finally, go get more data. Uh, when the data is insufficient, do what you can to find more. So we're starting to think about um, working with other third-party vendors to get better demographics data, seeing if we can partner with them. We're a small company, we're only like 250 people, um, so we, we have to be very cognizant of what we're spending money on and how much money we're spending, um, rather than just throwing all the money at Google to get all of their data. And also, um, we could probably do a little bit more investigating into our social media sources like Twitter and Facebook. Uh, Twitter is, is a small part of our audience, but provides a lot of rich demographic information. Facebook is a little bit hard to actually get the data out because Facebook doesn't want to give you their data. Um, and there's other third parties. So this is the general strategy that I use when I'm faced with a data set that is less than ideal. The first is I really have to sit down and figure out what's the problem I'm trying to solve. This is the most important thing you can do because uh, everything you do after this point needs to be in service of this particular question. So if you can't like very clearly and specifically find, uh, define the problem that you're trying to solve, um, well, you need to sit down and do that. So uh, doing that also makes it easier to figure out what's wrong with your data, what's missing, what needs to be transformed better, um, what, what needs to be, um, I don't know, are there class, is there a class imbalance? Like, that's something you need to know before you actually start uh, modeling. So, um, yeah, so when I did my whole class imbalance thing at the commercial real estate startup, I was very, very new in my career, and I did not realize that that was going to be a problem until I did it, and I was like, oh, this is a problem. Um, finally, yeah, what do you need that you don't have? Can you go get it? Do you already have it somewhere? Um, is it hidden? You know, like, uh, for example, at Mashable, there's this whole database that I didn't really know about until um, far too late of, of all the activity that happens in our content management system, which is really, really interesting and informative of how um, editors and writers think about content creation. And finally, some things to keep in mind. First, the data that your comp company collects is complicated, far more complicated than the IRIS data set. Um, what you do to your data and with your data is going to affect the model. Every little thing you do is, is going to have an effect downstream. So um, it's important to put a lot of thought into what you're doing with your data. Uh, creativity is your friend. Sometimes you'll be in, in tight situations like strict deadlines, uh, less, than, less than perfect tools to work with, and you'll just have to think really, really outside of the box to make stuff happen. Um, and also, there's a lot of different ways to solve a problem. So that's very, very much tied up into creativity. And finally, when it comes down to it, keep calm and code Python. Thank you very much. Uh, no, I'm not taking questions because we are right at the end of the time, but please tweet at me or come talk to me. Thank you so much. Day, seven days a week, or maybe eight hours a day, five days a week. Um, I'm not taking any questions. I have a lot to get through, so, um, but please tweet at me. I'm very responsive on Twitter, so uh, if you feel inclined, I'm at Sarah underscore Guido. So this talk is basically a day in the life of a data scientist. What I go through, 
every day getting data into proper for format for modeling. Sometimes messy and complicated, so I'm going to show you three examples of dealing with super uncooperative data. So data that's been in some way flawed, whether that's class imbalance or there's something wrong with the structure of the data or I've had to do some acrobatics to transform the data properly. Real data, commercial real estate data, ad data, user activity engagement data, media data, large data, small data, medium data, all of it. Um, so Mashable, if you don't know, is a, a digital media site that publishes a lot of articles about internet culture, entertainment, tech, We're really cool, you should check us out. Um, I do all of my data sciencing in Python. I use Jupyter Notebooks every day, I use NumPy, SciPy, Scikit, Pandas, you name it, I'm using it. And once again, you can find me on Twitter at at Sarah underscore Guido. So here we have the Iris data set. And if you've done anything with data science, you already know about this data set. But basically, this is a very simple, clean, tidy data set. There are four features related to the characteristics of the iris, and there's uh, a species column, which is the, the de designation of the species of iris for that particular flower. So this data set is mostly used to exemplify classification. You're, you're trying to classify these different irises into a specific species based on their characteristics. So the idea for this talk came out of a conversation I was having with some friends of mine about how a lot of material out there online sets this very simple premise for doing data science. And the premise is this. You start by importing a very simple data set like this. So uh, this is just my own experience working in the industry. So it's not necessarily any sort of ground truth for how you should be working with your data. This is just my own experience. Um, but I hope you can learn something useful. Also, this talk is mostly for people with less experience in data science to sort of give you a taste of what it's like to work as a data scientist. So I'm if you are a data scientist, I'm going to be talking very high level and simplifying a lot of things. So sorry, not sorry. But first, who am I? I am a senior data scientist at Mashable in New York City. I've worked in the, in the data science industry in New York for around three years now. I've dealt with a lot of different kinds of data. I've dealt with agricultural. Okay, welcome to the last session. Uh, we're gonna hear uh, Sarah Guido talk to us about uh, data wrangling. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah Guido, and this is the wild west of data wrangling. And what I mean by that is the messy, complicated world of data that data scientists like myself operate in every day, all day, 24 hours a 